This Tuesday, Republican nominee Donald Trump will face off against Vice President Kamala Harris, the current Democratic designee. The so-called debate will be burdened with rules constructed among the parties, including ABC News, none of which provide for input from the public about the subject matter. For more on all of that, we go to Philadelphia to speak with political science analyst Professor Tony Montero of the Philadelphia Saturday Free School. So Tuesday, the big day, the one chance that Trump and Harris have at each other, I guess we don't get any chance to ask them any questions since the format having been published does not include a list of questions, let alone a solicitation of questions from the public, like what would you like us to ask as your trustees? Mm -hmm. What do you see with the spectacle? Well, uh, we'll have to see what it turns out to be. It could become a spectacle or it could become something close to the public's uh, seeing uh, the differences in policy and character uh, of the two candidates. Uh, Now, of course, uh, it is not going to be, I don't think, one of those engagements where fundamental questions uh, such as war and peace, poverty, uh, where is the U.S. economy going, uh, does the military budget undermine uh, social uh, programs and the uplift of the poor and working people. Uh, I don't think we'll hear any of that. I don't think the uh, journalists from ABC uh, are even predisposed to that. Uh, So uh, at its best, it will be a very limited uh, political and intellectual event. Uh, But we might learn something uh, about the two, at least uh, certain of the contrasts between them. And of course, the pressure is on uh, Kamala Harris because uh, the public in in a recent poll, at least 30 percent, said they don't know enough about her and want to know more about her. Uh, In a sense, this is her coming out party. Um, We know Trump uh, after these eight or nine years Uh, We've seen him in public. He's uh, a constant presence uh, in the media for good or bad. And so that's what I think we're looking at uh, in less than two months before the election. So let's look at the role that this is playing in the whole process. We had uh, no real primary season for the Democratic Party's candidate. Uh, Joe Biden was uh, propped up to soak up the process as far as that goes and uh, then at a strategic moment uh, taken down and a selection made giving the nomination to Harris Mm -hmm. Uh, I understood that she was the only person really poised to uh, deal with that because uh, any other choice outside of that process would have looked like an an affront to her Um, but the, the fact is that she's she has no votes going into uh, this election. She's been put up clearly by the deep state, by the insiders, party hacks, whatever terminology you want to use. Um, and she, she's being put up against Trump at a time when he's being prosecuted from every which way. And uh, no matter your opinion of him or his uh, activities or his history, whatever, uh, clearly he is not the choice of the insiders. What's the, what are the dynamics here, you know, the, the contextual stuff? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, in plain view, uh, for all to see, and people will interpret this in all kind of different ways, but it's obvious that in this election, Trump is the outsider, by which we mean uh, he is viewed as uh, outside of the ruling elite the ruling class of the country, and they are attacking him as such, and they are uniting to make sure that he doesn't become the 47th president of the United States. I mean, that's a fact of life. Now, what you do with it is another thing. 
but the fact is that that these are not uh, candidates who are equal in the sense of their support from and for the existing ruling elite of this country. Um, you know, I, I've always found it um, interesting uh, that uh, so-called leftists who exist on the margins and as outsiders, uh, many of them find it so easy to have um, embraced uh, Harris and before her, uh, Biden, uh, who are the ruling class, who are the politicians of the war makers and the neoliberals and the globalists and, uh, as they put it, the establishment. Uh, and and they make um, a very weak uh, uh, political and ideological move justifying this, saying in effect, which is the same narrative of the ruling elite, that Trump is a fascist and a danger to, quote, our democracy. Uh, and there's very thin evidence that that uh, position you have to literally take as a, a matter of faith. Uh, but there's no one that has proven uh, empirically that Trump is a fascist or that Biden and now Kamala Harris are not uh, uh, supporters of fascism uh, in, in certain other ways. But yeah, I, I think this is what we're coming up on. I think, you know, these, these last uh, less than two months, uh, most voters are going to make up their minds, not whether they uh, like uh, on this day or the other day, Harris or Trump, uh, but how much they believe that an outsider is necessary to begin to change the system, which 70% of uh, voters say has to be changed. So it's a different kind of election. It's not a policy election. It's not uh, a Democrat versus Republican election. It is whether or not the existing configurations of power and rule should continue as they have been for almost 80 years or whether or not now is the time to begin to make a significant change. So we're looking at some of the numbers after the election. They're trying to get a projection of how people will respond to this one or that one winning the election. Will you be satisfied that it was a fair process and will you, you know, will you take it basically or will you do something else? And in the process of doing that, of course, it raises the question that each of the things that happens between now and the election where they measure, you know, the impact of this thing. In other words, there'll be a poll, you know, there'll be polling done tomorrow after the debate, and there will be polls that will indicate this one or that one won the debate. Uh, if the past months are any indication, they're going to uh, measure that uh, this debate lifted Harris over Trump yet again, um, and that uh, there's starting to be daylight between them larger than the uh, statistical uh, adjustments. Um, what, what kind of, uh, reception do you think that this, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that there are repeated public relations efforts to float Harris's boat uh, further than the water will carry it. Um, how likely do you think that is to change and, and, and what do you think that implies for what's coming down the pike? I don't think it means that much at all. Uh, the mainstream will say what it's been saying. And uh, most people have heard it so much that it's, um, you know, it's just background noise at this time. Uh, and the reason, um, you know, what the polling says about who won or who lost or what the majority believes uh, was important about the debate, I don't think that matters so much because such a tiny part of the electorate uh, that is uh, no more than 300,000 people in seven battleground states will decide this. Uh, I think it's even uh, fewer. I think it's 100,000 in the three uh, industrial states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin 
who will decide this and more specifically what black men do in Philadelphia, Detroit, and uh, Milwaukee. And even more specifically, what probably something like 25,000 black men do could decide everything, whether they vote for Trump or don't vote at all could be the decisive thing. The election is just that close. And of course, uh, what will be important is not who gets the popular vote, but who wins the electoral college. So uh, these large aggregate numbers uh, that polls uh, are based upon might not be uh, the critical uh, numbers, especially as we draw closer uh, to election day. President Montero, thank you very much for your time. You're so, welcome. For KPFK, I'm Don DeVar.